I think everything is, is great. Our national anthem was well performed today. I hope you see my face now. <laughs> Yesterday there was President Obama's palm actually <laughs> closing my face <laughs> in a group photo at the UN. But today in Mongolian media there is a new theory of conspiracy that <laughs> President Obama and President El Bigdorj is making the PR for him, you know, for the El Bigdorj. <laughs> That's, that's really good, uh, good PR for me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for President Obama, you know. <laughs> he, he actually didn't intend to do that, you know. After the photo, he said, hey, guys, like this, and that, that closed my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Madam President Otumbaiba and my friends, Carl Gershman and others, and let me thank, first of all, the Foreign Policy Association and the National Endowment for Democracy for in inviting me and honoring me today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a son of herdsmen, and you know, I, I born and grown up, and it's a really, really great tribute to my, my people, actually, who uh, who bravely choose freedom, is standing in front of you, is speaking here. And uh, also I want to start by offering my sympathy and solidarity with the American people on, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy. Uh, as we stand here in shadow of the Freedom Tower, I can say this, America has emerged stronger and more determined and I think the world is more determined to fight for democracy and individual liberties. Ladies and gentlemen, in this room I see many champions of democracy. I see representatives from the groups and organizations that have played leadership roles in promoting democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Some studies show that the history of democracy accounts for roughly 2,500 years in the history of mankind. This year, Mongolia celebrated 2,220 years of statehood, which marks a historic event when nomadic Mongol tribes choose their first, first ruler at a great assembly. So I guess you can say that we Mongols were there very close to the start of the burst of democracy as a system of governance. That man who created the great Mongol state, Genghis Khan, said, one thing which we, we all have to be mindful, it is easy to conquer the world on the horseback. What's challenging is to dismount and try to govern. <laughs> Today, Mongolia is recognized as one of the most politically and economically li liberalized states in our region. My country has been referred to as the democratic anchor in the East, and I believe this is very true. When we look around the world, I think we can say that democracy or democratic process is now the dominant political system in the world. In the early 1970s, Professor Samuel Huntington identified and defined the third wave of global democratization. Since then, the number of democracies has tripled. Today, majority of the countries that are gathering at, at, at this great, great assembly can be considered democratic. I believe that the Arab Spring we have witnessed this year has set forth a fourth wave of democracy that is washing across the shores of many countries, especially those in the Middle East. This should give us a collective sense of optimism, but it must be careful optimism. If we examine the trends of democratic development as it has unfolded in many states, there are grounds for concern. In many insta instances, it can be like a pendulum that can swing back as far as it has swung forward. Professor Larry Diamond, who directs the Democracy Development and the Rule of Law Center at, uh, at Stanford University, 
has studied democratic development and his findings should give us pause. He estimates that since the mid of 1970s, there have been 53 breakdowns or reversals of democratic governance. Roughly half of them have occurred since 1999. Professor Diamond has stated his deep concern that these breakdowns in democratic governance are accelerating. As part of this, he sees civil institutions also under siege by anti-democratic forces. Just as these countries and institutions are being stressed and facing possible irreversal, irreversals, there has been a decrease in financial support for democracy, building programs that will have wide-ranging implications. For example, a lack of funds directed towards civil society organizations will have a direct impact on activities such as trainings, workshops, exchange programs, election monitoring, and support for education programs that are critical to the inter institu institutionalization of democratic governance. My friends, this is very sad. The Arab Spring, the fall of Berlin Wall, and the ending of the Cold War did not just happen by accident. The free world, the advanced industrial democracies of North America and Western Europe were united in purpose and dedication to fight communism, the pre uh, perseverance and sacrifice, investment and focused work that involved many thousands of people who have participated in workshops, trainings, and outreach to those living under oppression. This helped collapse the Berlin Wall and peacefully end the Cold War without a shot being fired. You know, now I'm reading my paper, which I prepared for this meeting and uh, <laughs> to, to share with you. And uh, I think uh, when, when, uh, when, 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 when I talk this, these things, I, I, I also said my concerns about uh, democracy in the, at, at the opening of the General Assembly of the UN, and I would like to read also part of my speech here. As I feel here as a General Assembly of, of, of democratically minded people here, you know, I said, the Arab change will be followed by the Arab challenge. Although a democratic process is homegrown phenomenon, it should be supported by international cooperation. Here I have a message to industrialized democratic countries. Do not withdraw from the battle. On the other hand, democratization does not mean westernization. Democracy ought to develop naturally in line with historical and cultural development specifies of, even, of given country. Not else, respect for freedom, justice, and human rights, and the strict abidance by the rule of law are common to all successful and responsive democracies. Bad governance is the worst problem of all. Therefore, any aspiration to improve the and streamline such a governance ought to be strongly supported at all times. Libya has entered a new era as a result of the relentless courage and patience of the Libyan rebels who have persevered for many months in their struggle for freedom human rights and democracy. Colonel Gaddafi called his fellow countrymen rats and brutally hunt them down and exterminate. Now he himself is being hunted as a rat from hole to hole, from trench to trench. And this is the fate which awaits anyone who suppresses the people, people's love for freedom and desire to live in dignity. I think that was a good line, that the right line our diplomats wanted to skip from my speech, you know, eliminate, but I stood, I had to read it at the General Assembly, I read it, yeah. Also, I condemn the international community should not shy away from condemning the regime of Syria's Bashar al-Assad, who has inhumanely and brutally chosen bloodshed to crack down on freedom and justice 
craving peaceful protesters by using combat vehicles, snipers, and military force. Let us unanimously demand that he ends his atrocities. We must make We must make the necessary decision to that effect without delay and help the courageous people of Syria who are craving freedom and justice and are losing dozens of their brave sons and daughters every day. The love for freedom is the greatest force in the world. No tyranny, no cruelty regime can resist it forever. I would like to say these words to the authorities of Yemen and dictators seeking to suppress their citizens fight for freedom. That was part of my speech at the, at the UN. <laughs> you know, my friends, uh, I, I think justice is non-negotiable. It's absolute. Values of the human societies works as the laws of physics. And we know all that apple falls everywhere the same. I think it's still it's long way to go for arrival of the liberal democracy in a singular up country, but desire to live in dignity with freedom and political choice is becoming almost universal. In many places, people feel generally greater unease if not disgust with their authoritarian rule. We all know that on December 17, 2010, in, in, in Tunisia, young man called Mohamed Boa Azazi, but his cart was the, confiscated by police and he went to the in front of the provisional headquarters and dosed himself self in fuel and lit himself on fire. I think he does not have anything no honest judiciary to hear his case. No independent media in Tunisia during that time, I think, to give him a voice. No credible party to represent his views. No fair and just election to change their leader. But uh, I usually think that, uh, but making that uh, those media, those uh, judiciary today work for the Gaddafi or the, or the Ben Ali, Tomorrow, it cannot, yeah, it, it, it's really difficult to turn out. It should work for the, like the man who is, whose name is Mohammed Boazazi. I think it will take time. I think there will be difficult times in Middle East in emerging democracies, and we have to help them. I think when we were there in the streets in Ulaanbaatar in a cold winter, I think we felt that your support, American support and other friends support there and because of that we succeeded. And because of that my simple message is do not withdraw from the battle. Every country has a problem, you know, every country has a problem and we have to support that, uh, that those brave and uh, brave men and women who are fighting for their freedom. And I think that uh, kind of uh, those tyrannies, those people has uh, two strategies. One strategy is oppression, one strategy is diversion. But those strategies are not going to work at all. Because world has changed, because there is new technology, because there is new generation. You know, during 20 years, there were, when, when we tried to change my country, there weren't any cell phone, any Facebook, any Twitter, anything. Now they have that, you know. Those, uh, those dictators now ought to be understand that. And imagine that Mongolia was 20 some years ago like a North Korea-like society. Mongolia is the second communist country remaining under communism, you know, for 70 years. Today we are chairing community of democracy. Today Mongolia is the champion for the, for, for the, global, for the global fight for democracy. And in 1990, with, without shattering single window, we actually made the transition between Soviet Union and between China. During that time, Soviet Union was intact and Tiananmen massacre, ha massacre happened, you know, but we made that great transition. We made that great transition without bloodshed and we made 
political change and economic change at the same time. Many people say that that's not Asian way, you know, but we broke that all the stereotype. It can be enjoyed in Asia, it can be enjoyed even by poor herdsmen in Mongolia. You know, when the journalists ask me why you are talking about human rights, why you are talking about rule of law, these are the Western values. My answer is no, they are not Western values. That's my value, that's my freedom, that's my democracy, you know. My parents worked for the Soviet type of kolkhoz. They were confiscated all their cattle in order to slaughter one sheep. They had to get permission. In order to go from one province to other province, they had to get permission, like visa. Now, I think they, in, in Mongolia, all those things are actually eliminated. Now, our all herdsmen have their herd, their cattle. And now, in order to slaughter any sheep, they no need any permission, you know. That's the, their freedom, own their ships. My mother every night pray for Dalai Lama or for Buddha. That's her freedom. That's not Western freedom. That's her democracy, actually. That's her freedom. You know, believing. And I think uh, that kind of cry and that kind of things usually make people to listen. I really think that the people's outcry have a voice and vote, they became personal. When, when they became the personal stakeholder, when they became the, uh, having the personal voice, I think they became the stakeholders in their future. And we, we see many, many challenges in, in the world. You know, they go, 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 go for their freedom and they, they usually succeed and they usually, you know, they, they even, uh, uh, even tolerate the high price, they, they even tolerate ev everything, but they cannot tolerate one thing, worst government, corruption. Most of the democracies failed because of the corruption. Because of that, while we are chairing the community of democracies, we launched the initiative Zero Tolerance on Corruption. Zero Tolerance on Corruption. I think that's, uh, that, and uh, I, I hope many, many states will, will, will support our, our our initiative. And I really feel that people hearing that louder than those voices of the for freedom than the fires against them, you know, gunshots against them. And we have to support that. Those people's voice louder than those gunshots from the militias, those tyrannies. And the uh, and, and world, 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 I think, listening to that. And Mongolia, we do not have anything to teach to the people, but we have something to share with others. And we really would like to share uh, our, our lessons, and there are many lessons, and uh, I wrote many things, but it's too late, you know. You have to go to home and to enjoy, you know, <laughs> this, this meeting here, and, 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 and I would like to say, you know, Mongolians one time, exerted some nations to build the biggest walls, longest walls. <laughs> but today we would like to help to, to, to those nations suppressed by tyranny to tear down, to tear down those curtains. <laughs> and many people, just I entered to this room, many people asked, I would like to go to Mongolia, you know. Please come to Mongolia. There is only country, you know, yeah, more horses than people. We have uh, six million horses and three million people. Many ask it, I would like to ride horses. Please come to ride horses, you know. That's a that's great place to do business. I think if you would like to see a real challenge coming from communism to freedom, that's the place to go to see. If you would like to see endless step, if you would like to see good-hearted people, that's the place to go, that's the place called Mongolia. And I really want, want you to come to Mongolia and work together and to make our world the better place to live in. And you know, I really believe that God has planted in every heart the desire to live free. 
And even though that desire crushed sometimes, it will rise again. It will rise again. And I, I believe that one day all men and women will live free. And let the freedom come to every house. Let the freedom come to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. 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 I know. I know it's late. I know it's late, but uh, we've received a number of written questions. It's late. We're going to do this. You know, maybe about half the questions I'll I'll read, and the president will. I, I've I've heard him do this before. He has a very succinct way of answering questions. So please take your seats. It will be about five more minutes while he's going to respond to a few questions. First, I want to note that while the President was speaking, we were joined by one of the people that Bob Miller introduced earlier, Erwin Kotler, who is a Canadian parliamentarian, the former Justice Minister, and really the leading voice in Canada for human rights, and really one of the leading voices in the world. Erwin Kotler's city right there. Okay, here we go. How do you deal with the two powerful neighbors who are not democratic? <laughs> you know, yeah, we really respect our two neighbors. Of course, our foremost importance to have great relations with our neighbors. And we used to live next to each other for centuries. And we know how to deal with our two neighbors. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel that uh, like a freedom loving small pony between two big elephants. No, when you have that uh, value, when you have that value connection, we feel that we are connected with the world. We feel that, you know, world is our friend. And because of that, you know, all other nations we call our third neighbor. But that third neighbor expression was first uh, was said that by the James Baker when he visited June in 1990 in Mongolia, and he said, you know, you have two neighbors, and we would like to be your third neighbor. Actually, we lack that expression now that's in our, uh, our, our, uh, our uh, official policy. And uh, we, we really welcome our, uh, all our people from the third neighbor, and we really welcome those investments. I see today many investors here interested to invest in Mongolia. I think Mongolia can be a great hub financial hub, great hub for the mining. And you know, we share with the China more than 4,000 kilometers border, and we are next to the biggest, fastest growing economy in the world. And also Russia is a big country, and Mongolia can be, you know, very good hub for not only for freedom, for the free market, for the exercising, for the uh, taking those opportunities, make good business. Yeah. Now, in following up on that, there's a question that says, as an emerging economy, how will Mongolia manage mining and other resource extraction in a way that balances development needs with environmental concerns? You know, we are aware about that. Uh, there are m many nations who endowed with the natural resources usually end up very badly. There are few nations succeeded. When I see what kind of nations are succeeding, those nations are free and those nations are open. Those nations are governed by not elite few. They, those nations are governed by the will of their people. I think Mongolia is a democratic country. Mongolia is an open country. Because of that, we listen to our people and we are governed by their, their instructions. And people are closely, very closely watching there is no single media entity which is controlled by go government. Every media in Mongolia is free and private. I think also we have a very healthy civil society, and they are following, they are seeing every mistake, everything we make. I think we, we, we do not feel that we are making mistakes, but when they criticize, when they demand those things, we see that, and we are learning by doing. They are like the you know, mother-in-law and following every shadow things and looking, ah, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you know. You have to, those things alive there and 
and, and keep it. I think those, uh, those are, are will be guaranteed. Of course, our great neighbors, and if you make their good business in processing, if you export, there is very close, very close, big markets in, uh, to, to the Mongolia. Those two things, I think, very attractive to make business in Mongolia. Yeah. Two more questions. The first one is, how should the world respond to the speech earlier today at the United Nations of Iran's President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad? Yeah, I, I actually spoke before him because of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if, if I speak, I, I spoke after him, I, I speak the same, I, 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 I would make same, same speech, yeah. You know, yeah, those people who are suppressing those uh, freedom and their nations, you know, desire to live in freedom, I think, I think they are not, not, not going to succeed. You know, uh, I really, why I like the freedom uh, why, why we feel that a strong link with the United States of America I usually say that some nations, you know, offer the world fine wine or fine cars. Why America is attractive? America is offering the freedom. America is stand on the freedom very firmly. Because of that, that's the most the strongest force, most the strongest force to attract the world. I think we would like to be with you. Well, uh, you know, earlier, 20 years ago, we got your help and your support. Now, our turn to support others. Even small Mongolia has uh, that commitment. When I met uh, with the President Obama, I told him, you know, we have a shared strategic interest. Why I am saying that shared means that we dream together for that interest. You know, rule of law, human rights, justice. And we share the strategic interest we are fighting for that together. We fought it for, in, in Iraq, you know, more than thousands of the men and uh, women in a uniform, they served shoulder to shoulder with others in Iraq, now in Afghanistan. Now we are doubling our commitment in Afghanistan. I think you see that when, when you got one small nation, free nation, it became, you know, friend of the free world. When people get their freedom, usually people get tend to make their actions more thoughtful. When they make their actions more thoughtful, they become more creative. Because of that, from freedom there is prosperity, from freedom there is peace. I really, I, I really believe in that. Yeah. That's beautiful, that's beautiful. Thank you. One last question on a, we have a, a group here from Southern Mongolia, which is in China. Uh, and they've raised the question of what the policy is of the Mongolian government toward a Mongolian asylum seekers from China who come to Mongolia, and they mentioned the case of Mr. Badzanga who was arrested and sent back to China. Tough question. You know, in the world, there is 10 million Mongolians, and roughly 3 million live in Mongolia, and 5 million live in China in the inner Mongolia. Twice as much Mongolians actually live in China. And of course, we would like to maintain great relations with China, but we never shy to speak in Mongolia about human rights violation. You know, we never shy those people who strive to be free. We talk it, our press talk it, our people talk it, my government talk it. But of course, maintaining neighborly and respectful good relations with China is very important. I think about China, all the world are speaking. Not only Mongolia, you guys stay ocean away from China, even you are speaking here about China. And we are also talking about China, but we are trying to keep very good relations, but, but, but we are never trade with our with our values, of course, yeah. We stand on our values, yeah. And I know that Mongolia is an inspiration to the Mongolians in China, as well as to people around the world. This is a very special evening, and for thank you for taking those questions and for answering them so clearly and so frankly. Um, Mongolia really is something special, um, and your leadership is something which is valued very deeply, not only in Mongolia, but here, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
That concludes the evening. Thank you very much.